Hello from Maryland Books at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Jeff Helgeson. What I'm talking about today is probably one of the greatest and swiftest paradigm shifts within what's been termed the history of ideas. This seismic epistemological change began during the late 1700s hundreds, and continues to influence the way in which many, many people think about things in life even today. Such issues as whether or not science is real or morally ethical, the validity of a distinctly personal interpretation of experience, and the overall credibility of human intuition each have their modern intellectual roots deeply embedded within that period of time. Arthur Lovejoy, in his William James Lectures on Philosophy and Psychology, presented at Harvard University in 1932 and 33, and then published three years later as a book titled The Great Chain of Being, a Study of the History of an Idea, asserted that the thin end of the wedge which brought about this titanic shift in perspective initially became evident in the style of landscape gardening with a change in fashion from the geometric shapes of the formal grounds surrounding places like the Palace of Versailles to the vogue for the so-called English garden within which things grew wild and without trimming and in all the rich diversity of their natural shapes. In literature, this overall change in fashion is reflected in a move from Alexander Pope's assertion that true ease in writing comes from art, not chance as those move easiest who have learned to dance, to William Wordsworth's definition of poetry as the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings recollected in tranquility. That alteration in point of view reflects what is commonly described as a move from the logic-based materialistic rationalism of the Age of Enlightenment to a worldview that embraces a felt sense of things ranging from heightened subjective awareness to speculations about the unseen realm of the supernatural. This shift in style, described by H.W. Jansen in his History of Art as being carefully planned to look unplanned, also inspired a gothic revival that, in some instances, even involved the new construction of apparently abandoned runes as landscape features, sometimes including hired hermits to inhabit them, as explained by Gordon Campbell in his book appropriately titled The Hermit in the Garden. The change in the zeitgeist, or spirit of the age, it seems was something far more than a mere drifting away from a taste for topiary. It was, for all intents and purposes, a transformation in what Jansen calls an attitude of mind, a movement from reason to emotion and wonder at the phenomena of the apparently natural world as opposed to the increasingly human-made environment of urban centers and their quickly developing industrialization. Um, according to J.B. Priestley in Literature and Western Man, the transformation in heart and mind for writers of all kinds began with Jean-Jacques Rousseau's unconscious bursting like a dam contributing what J.M. Cohen termed in the introduction in his 1952 Penguin Classics translation of Rousseau's can Confessions more than any other man to the growth of the Romantic movement. When 
1749, already having abandoned his five children to a foundling home, on the road to Vincennes to talk to the encyclopedist Denis Diderot in jail for having criticized the French government. Great truths descended upon him in a torrent, challenging and then defeating the rational conscious mind, persuading Rousseau that the degeneration of human beings, who were generally good noble savages by nature, had resulted from the development of the arts and sciences, in other words, the rational efforts of human civilization and the implicit social contract which they involved. This sea change in awareness, providing the basis for Rousseau's award-winning entry in an essay competition, clearly extended far beyond a new approach to gardening. It was eventually represented by a shift in architecture from the neoclassical principles of symmetry and balance and proportion reflecting the democratic and republican ideals of ancient Greece and Rome that eventually pressed the age of, revolution, of reason into revolution in both America and France to a castellated neo-medieval sense of design which reached back to the social stratification of feudal European society. Eventually, under the influence of nature as a universal metaphor, something that William Wordsworth would ultimately claim never did betray the heart that loved her, the uh, new style of mind morphed its way into the evolutionary theory of Charles Darwin, the arts and crafts movement, the ornamental vegetative patterns created by Louis Sullivan, various forms of Art Nouveau, and even the organic style of architecture practiced by Frank Lloyd Wright well into the middle of the 20th century. In visual art, change was from clarity and mythological motifs to unrestrained, sublime depictions of nature at its most intensely extreme, the exoticism of Eugene Delacroix, the visions of Francisco Goya, and then the late Middle Ages style adopted by the Pre-Raphaelites. With music, the progression was from the refined metric order of Joseph Haydn and Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart to the unrestrained passion of Ludwig van Beethoven and Hector Berlioz, in addition to Frederick Chopin, Franz Liszt, Giuseppe Verdi, Robert and Clara Schumann, Johannes Brahms, Franz Schubert, Peter Tchaikovsky, and Richard Wagner. In philosophy, Immanuel Kant introduced the concept of transcendental idealism that was later adopted by such 19th century Americans as Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, Herman Melville, and Walt Whitman. As explained by uh, John B. Halstead in an introduction to a compilation of primary texts from around the early 19th century. Romanticism, as a critique of Enlightenment ideas, can be seen as a new study of the basis of knowledge and of the whole scientific enterprise. It rejected a science dominated by physics as inadequate to describe the reality of experience and turned to the life sciences for more fully satisfactory insights and analogies. The universe romanticists believed in was an expanding, evolving universe. Their concern moved from physics 
to biology and from plants to planets. Within this context, it is probably no coincidence that during the first decade of the 19th century, the German philosopher George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel developed a conception of history based upon the notion of a continual dialectic between opposite interpretations of experience, a thesis implying its antithesis, which eventually results in a combined synthesis of these respective worldviews, which of course implies its opposite, and to borrow from a 1970s Farrah Fawcett shampoo commercial, so on and so on and so on and so on. This idea was later picked up by Karl Marx, who saw the pattern play itself out in France with the absolutism of King Louis XVI, the 1789 revolution, and then the rise of Napoleon in 1798, and his efforts to bring together the ideals of the Enlightenment with his own brand of charismatic imperial rule, while also seeking to topple all the monarchs of Western Europe and selling off half of the North American continent to the fledgling democracy of the United States. Marx, of course, applied Hegel's philosophy of history to economics, seeing feudalism as a thesis leading to capitalism with the 1776 publication of Adam Smith's The Wealth of Nations that ultimately would result in a synthesis form of from each according to his ability to each according to his need communism as he predicted in Das Kapital very likely not anticipating Ayn Rand and Atlas Shrugged nor its postmodern nationalist adherence in America and across the European continent, most of whom I suspect have only the vaguest awareness of any of these texts and have seldom, if ever, considered the phenomena which they attempted to address. And then again, there was literature. Starting as early as 1742, it's been speculated, although not published until 1750, the primary themes of Romanticism, sensitivity to the patterns of nature, regard for people who directly work the soil with a nod to Rousseau and his noble savage idea, emotional sentimentality, and the express presence of God within the natural world had made their way into Thomas Gray's elegy written in a country churchyard. Beginning the curfew tolls the knell of parting day, the lowering herd winds slowly o'er the lee, the plowman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me and continuing to the epitaph of a nameless local who had lived far from the maddening crowd gray laid the foundation upon which writers for the next hundred or so years would construct their variations on a theme Oliver Goldsmith followed suit, moving the setting from England to Ireland in around 1768 with The Deserted Village, surprisingly dedicated to the leading English portrait painter, Sir Joshua Reynolds, who once had said, a mere copier of nature can never produce anything great. The poem laments the notion that rural virtues leave the land when the residents of sweet auburn loveliest village of the plain move off to seek employment in great britain's newly industrialized urban centers where wealth accumulate and men decay in scotland robert burns born in 1759 in a thatched 
roof cottage his father had made with his own hands, even quoted Thomas Gray at the beginning of his poem, The Cotter's Saturday Night, invoking our Creator's praise before going on as he committed the sin of rhyme with meteor-like novelty in his volume titled Commonplace Book and along with the birth of two sons, nine days apart with two different women, in To a Mouse, Burns observed that the, uh, the best laid schemes of mice and men do often go awry, although he also, in addition to offering up Flow Gently, Sweet Afton, John Barleycorn, a ballad, and on his deathbed, the lyrics which have brought in every new year for the past couple of centuries, should old acquaintance be forgot and never brought to mind, should old acquaintance be forgot and old ang syne, old time since, or times past. By 1763, the fad for rustic works had also made an international best seller of the supposedly rediscovered poems of an early medieval Gaelic bard called Ossian, which ultimately turned out to be forgeries created by another Scottish poet named James Macpherson. A year later, the son of a British prime minister, as well as a one-time friend and continental travel companion of Thomas Gray, named Horace Walpole, wrote the world's first Gothic novel, The Castle of Oranto. In 1774, a 24-year-old Johann Wolfgang von Goethe largely defined the romantic hero in his novel, The Sorrows of Young Bertha, and was quickly joined in the German Schrum und Drang, storm and stress, or drive or desire, depending upon who's doing the uh, translation in English, movement by Frederick Schiller, with plays like The Robbers, Mary Stuart, and William Tell, later adopted into a four-act opera by Giacomo Rossini, the overture of which eventually became the 1950s television theme music for The Lone Ranger, featuring the one-time Edgewater resident Clayton Moore, along with his faithful Native American companion, Tonto, a.k.a. J. Silverheels. Then, back in England, having been impressed by the poems attributed to Ossian, as well as those of John Milton, along with the Bible and John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, a one-time engraver's apprentice who originally left school at the age of 10 and had experienced celestial visions since early childhood, named William Blake, after having studied art under Joshua Reynolds at the British Royal Academy, was encouraged to publish poetry he'd composed and recited under the title Poetical Sketches. This was followed by a bite the hand that fed him satire of Blake's initial literary supporters called An Island in the Moon, and then in 1789 his amazing illuminated printing work was published called Songs of Innocence that, five years later, was combined with additional poems to create a new illustrated volume titled Songs of Innocence and of Experience, including Tiger, Tiger, Burning Bright in the Forest of the Night, What Immortal Hand or Eye Could Frame Thy Fearful Symmetry. In spite of once being tried and acquitted of high treason, after an altercation with an English soldier during which Blake was accused of insulting the British king and praising Napoleon Bonaparte, the words from Blake's poem Jerusalem, as set to music by Sir Herbert Perry and orchestrated by 
Sir Edward Elgar, have often been used as England's unofficial national anthem, which George V once is reported to have said he preferred to God save the king. Then to Aside from creating his own cosmology in the marriage of heaven and hell, Blake's assertion that if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is infinite, was picked up by Aldous Huxley, the author of Brave New World, for the title of his mid-20th century hallucinations book, and then provided the name for 1960s rocker Jim Morrison's band, The Doors. Blake also created illustrations for Milton's Paradise Lost and Dante's Divine Comedy, as well as illustrating the stories of Mary Wollstonecraft, the very early feminist author of A Vindication of the Rights of Women, who died in childbirth while bringing her daughter with the novelist William Goodwin into the world, who was also named Mary, presumably in memory of her mother, and who would one day become the second wife of the romantic poet Percy Shelley and write the novel Frankenstein. Finally, although published posthumously, William Blake additionally conveyed posterity, the insight that it is possible to see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. In prose, Charles Lamb followed Rousseau by further exploring the autobiographical essay while caring for his highly intelligent but sometimes mentally deranged sister Mary, who had killed their mother and whose constant need for care created a circumstance which denied her sibling any chance of having a family of his own, and at around the same time, according to my high school textbook, Adventures in English Literature, Walter Scott prior to becoming knighted and the chief propagandist for King George IV, opened a new world of romance to an enthusiastic reading public, both in poetry and such historic novels as Ivanhoe. Next time, I'll be talking about the next couple of generations of romantics. Heirloom Books is located at 6239 North Clark Street in Chicago, Illinois. And I'm Jeff Helgeson.